Hi, Mark. Apologies to interrupt, but I think uh, you might have accidentally muted yourself. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, so why don't I uh, right. Okay, I'll just begin at the uh, beginning again. Look, uh, so uh, I'm contrasting what Kant's doing in the second section with what he's doing in the first section. And whereas the argument of the first section appealed to common rational moral cognition, that it was this uh, pre-reflective practical knowledge that we have of the rational standards that govern judgment, moral reasoning, as well as practical reasoning and action more generally, um, uh, and appealing only to such knowledge in the first section, right, Kant proposed to explicate the concept of the goodwill by considering the related concept of uh, duty, which led him to uh, characterize the supreme principle of morality as uh, um, uh, the formula of universal law. And Kant's conclusion was conditional, namely, if the supreme principle of morality exists, then, uh, uh, then its content is captured, at least in part, by the formula of universal law. Now, by contrast, the second section uh, uh, appeals to uh, a different kind of uh, knowledge. He's still considering the question, what is the supreme principle of morality? However, here, his argument outstrips what's given uh, merely by common rational moral cognition and has a more theoretical character. So instead of appealing only to pre-reflective practical knowledge, Kant <clears throat> appeals to reflective theoretical knowledge, okay? Uh, another difference from the first uh, uh, section uh, is that, well, on the basis of this theoretical knowledge, Kant's able to give us a richer characterization of the supreme principle of uh, morality in terms of a system of three uh, formulas. And again, Kant's conclusion is going to be conditional, namely, if the supreme principle of morality exists, then its content is characterized by this system of three formulas. Now, uh, I've repeated this a number of times, but it's going to be important as we go through. These three formulas represent the same principle, right? There are three formulations of one principle, and they differ only in representing different aspects of the same principle. This is going to be important in reading the groundwork any problem that you might have with a derivation of one of these formulas or with an application of one of these formulas might be due 
to our as of yet incomplete understanding of the supreme principle of morality. Each of the formulas only offers a partial representation of this supreme uh, principle. Okay, now there's going to be a third uh, 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 difference uh, and it concerns the argumentative strategy that is uh, uh, pursued, right? Uh, whereas the argument of section one preceded by reflecting on the concept of the goodwill, the argument of section two is going to proceed by reflecting on a different concept, uh, the concept of a categorical imperative. Now, we'll say a little bit more about that in today's lecture, but for now, you can think of a hypothetical imperative is something that presupposes the adoption of an end and prescribes an action as a means to achieving that end. So the normative force, the reason giving force of a hypothetical imperative is conditional, right? On the adoption of the antecedent end. So if a rational being has not adopted that end, uh, then he's not required to perform the action that's prescribed as a means to that end. Now, in contrast, right, the normative force of a categorical imperative is not conditional upon the adoption of any antecedent end, right? So a rational being is required to perform some relevant action whatever ends they may have in fact uh, uh, adopted, okay? That's roughly the contrast. And whereas in the first section, um, it counts reflecting on the nature of the goodwill. Uh, in the second section, he's going to be reflecting on the nature of the categorical uh, imperative. Um, now, uh, Today, we're gonna to be talking about the derivation and application of the first formula. Uh, the first formula has uh, 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 two variants. And uh, what Kant says about the first formula is it specifies the form of the law. And what he means by that is that it specifies a formal feature of the law the fact that it's valid for all rational uh, uh, beings. Now we've seen one of these variants already at the conclusion of the first section. Uh, so we saw the, uh, Kant give us a formulation of the formula of universal law, act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. We're presently going to be uh, introduced to a second variant, the formula of law of nature. Act as if the maxim of your action were to become by your will a universal law of nature. Now, why there's this subtle difference and why it's important will come to in a, a, a little bit. Okay, so we saw how Kant uh, distinguish two kinds of imperatives, hypothetical and categorical imperatives. And again, hypothetical imperatives presuppose the adoption of an end and prescribe an action as a means to that end, right? Uh, and in contrast, again, categorical uh, imperatives are such that their normative force, their reason giving uh, uh, weight is not conditional on the adoption of an antecedent end. So a rational being is somehow required to perform the relevant action, whatever ends they may have adopted. Now, there are two points of clarification that are uh, necessary. <clears throat> Um, first of all, uh, Kant's not making any grammatical distinctions, right? Uh, imperatives, for example, can be expressed by sentences in the indicative mood, right? Uh, think of aiding those in need as a good thing to do, okay? 
uh, that's a sentence in the indicative mood, but it's going to express a, a categorical imperative according to Kant. Uh, similarly, categorical imperatives, though being unconditional in the sense that they don't presuppose uh, the adoption of any end, can be expressed by conditional sentences, right? So if you make a promise, keep it. That's a conditional sentence, but it, uh, but it uh, prescribes a unconditional constraint on your behavior. Similarly, hypothetical imperatives, though conditional, again, in the sense of uh, 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 presupposing the adoption of some end, uh, their expression need not take the form of a conditional sentence, right? So I could say, look out. And this can express a hypothetical imperative to pay attention to something if you've adopted the end that you're interested in, in paying attention to it. Now, um, uh, the claim that categorical imperatives are unconditional and so not dependent upon the adoption of some antecedent end is uh, really easily misunderstood. Um, according to Kant, every action involves uh, 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 an end. Uh, rather, a categorical uh, imperative you can think of as a requirement uh, to take something as an end. It's a requirement on all rational beings insofar as they're rational to act for the sake of some end. What that is won't be clear to us until we get to the uh, second uh, formula. Um, uh, now, Kant thinks that a characterization of the supreme principle of morality is going to follow from the concept of a categorical imperative. Uh, now, the existence of such a principle doesn't follow uh, 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 from the concept of a categorical imperative. And remember, the overall argument, uh, argumentative structure of the groundwork, the question of the existence of the categorical uh, imperative is going to be postponed until the third section. Rather, what follows from the concept of a categorical imperative is merely, well, if there were such things, then they would have a certain characterization that they would be represented by, in this case, two variants of the first formula. Now, uh, the characterization is formal in that it abstracts from the value that grounds the imperative and considers only the form of categorical requirements. Okay, so here, here's Kant. He writes, uh, when I think of a hypothetical imperative in general, I do not know beforehand what it will contain. I do not know this until I'm given the condition. But when I think of a categorical imperative, I know at once what it contains. For, uh, for since the imperative contains beyond the law, only the necessity that the maxim be in conformity with this law, while the law contains no condition to which it be limited, nothing is left with which the maxim is to conform, but the universality of law as such. And this conformity alone is what the imperative properly represents as necessary. Okay, so now one concept we're gonna have to be clear about is the concept of a maxim. Uh, now you can think of a maxim as a rule or policy governing an action that a person uh, uh, adopts at least implicitly whenever they act. If you like, you could think of it as articulating the content of the intention with which that person act. Uh, a full statement of a maxim will be first personal, right? It was like, I will do such and such. Uh, It'll specify the action, the uh, circumstances in which the action is to be performed, uh, 
and the end or that for the sake of which one is acting in those circumstances. So in the ab abstract, a maxim, this rule or pos policy governing action that a person adopts, at least implicitly, whenever they act, uh, is going to uh, uh, take the form of uh, a first personal description of intention, expression of intention. I will perform action A in circumstances C for the sake of some end E. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, a categorical imperative requires that a person adopts a maxims in conformity with the law. We know that the law is based on objective grounds by which Kant means that they're grounds valid for all rational beings. They're thus uh, universally valid requirements on action. So from the concept of a categorical imperative, uh, uh, Kant provisionally concludes uh, that a categorical imperative requires that a person adopts maxims in conformity with the universality of law as such. Um, uh, now, at this point, from the claim that categorical imperatives require that a person adopts only maxims that conform to universal universality of law as such, Kant concludes, and here's Kant, there is therefore only a single categorical imperative, and it is this, act only in accordance with, in the, with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. Now, notice this is essentially the same derivation of the formula of universal law that Kant gave in the first section, right? He's uh, similarly moving from reasoning about from the universal applicability of the law to the formulation of the law in terms of uh, what you can or cannot will uh, to be a universal law. And it's subject uh, to the same sorts of difficulties, right? Um, you know, while the law may be valid for all rational beings, we've so far been given no reason to suppose that the law necessarily involves what a person could or could not will. Or put another way, from the fact that maxim should conform to universal law, it doesn't follow that the will of a rational being has any role in determining the content of the law. And just as the formula of universal law doesn't follow from the concept of a categorical imperative, neither does the other variant of the first formula, the formula of law of nature, and for precisely the same uh, reason. So again, I think Kant is plausibly anticipating the idea of autonomy here, uh, because uh, if rational beings are the authors of the moral law, as he's going to suggest later, then what rational beings could coherently will would be relevant to determining the content of the law of which they are potential authors. Uh, and again, this is underscores the way in which the three formulations uh, should try, uh, be read in uh, light of uh, one another. Okay, <clears throat> let's look at the formula of law of nature. Okay. Um, uh, the formula of universal law, Kant thinks, is abstract and so difficult to apply, but he thinks it's much easier and more intuitive to apply the formula of law of nature in determining the permissibility of a maxim. Uh, now, the formula of universal law differs from the law of nature in that the former involves willing a law whereas the latter involves willing a law of nature. Well, a law is necessary in the sense that there are reasons that rational beings must conform to it, right? Reasons uh, that were in play in legislating that law in the first place. A law of nature, on the other hand, is necessary in a distinct sense. Specifically, it's causally impossible for rational beings to act contrary to a law of nature. Um, 
This was once satirized in a Bugs Bunny routine when he was right running up a, a skyscraper, a traffic police uh, uh, stopped him and issued him a ticket for violating the law of gravity. The gag there precisely turns on the difference between uh, uh, laws and uh, laws of nature that we're presently uh, uh, um, attending to. Um, so look, Kant thinks that we can gain an intuitive understanding of which maxims are permissible uh, by imagining a generalized form of the maxim as a law of nature and uh, conjoining that with the uh, 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 laws of nature as we understand them. And if, uh, uh, if uh, uh, and, and by asking ourselves whether we could coherently will that the resulting hypothetical system of nature uh, in fact, uh, obtains. Now, it's useful to break this procedure down into four steps, okay? The first step is to specify the maxim to be tested. And again, think of it as the uh, expression of an intention, first person expression of an intention. So I am to perform action A in circumstances C in order to bring about end E. Now, the second step is to generalize the maxim, right? So everyone is to perform action A in circumstances C in order to bring about uh, end E. The third step is to transform this generalized maxim into a law of nature. So at this point, we would get it's a law of nature that everyone performs action A and circumstances C in order to bring about end E. And the fourth step is really the tricky step, right? The fourth step is to take this hypothetical law of nature that we've just invented from the original maxim uh, and uh, to conjoin it with the existing laws of nature as we understand them to be and to try to work out the, uh, the consequences uh, uh, of this new hypothetical system uh, of nature. Uh, and the maxim is going to be permissible just in case one could coherently will the resulting system of nature. Now, how you, you might ask, are we to decide whether we can coherently will the resulting system of nature? Well, there are two tests, right? Uh, there's the contradiction in conception test and the contradiction in volition test. And these two tests should be applied in that order, okay? Uh, so the contradiction in conception test uh, is whether or not the hypothetical system of nature can be conceived without self-contradiction, okay? So if somehow by adding this new law of nature into the existing law of nature's results in some internal incoherence or self-contradiction, then it's going to fail the contradiction in conception test. And we're going to conclude that the maxim uh, is impermissible. Uh, now, it could pass the contradiction in conception test. Uh, and if it does, we have to uh, apply the second test, the contradiction and volition, right? Uh, can we uh, coherently will this uh, hypothetical system of nature without uh, having any contradiction within our own uh, 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 volition? Now, it's unclear what exactly the contradiction and volition test is, but we'll get a better sense of it when we consider uh, uh, the uh, examples. And now what I would like to do is talk about uh, Kant's, uh, he gives us four examples, okay? Uh, these are examples of duties owed to uh, oneself and owed to others. Uh, and moreover, uh, these are uh, uh, 
uh, examples of uh, what he calls perfect and imperfect duties. And so they're supposed to be representative of uh, different classes uh, of duties. Um, and we're going to learn about how to apply the uh, formula of law of nature by uh, uh, seeing how they get applied to each of these classes of uh, uh, duties. Okay, so um, let's begin uh, with the uh, uh, prohibition on, on suicide. So in the first example, right, we have, uh, we begin as always with a specification of a maxim, right? And what we're testing is whether it's permissible to act on this maxim. Okay, so what's the maxim in this case? Well, Kant tells us explicitly, uh, from self-love, I make it my principle to shorten my life when it's longer, uh, duration threatens more troubles than it promises agreeableness. Um, now, uh, so let's recall our procedure. First, we state the maxim. Well, we've already done that. Second, we generalize the maxim. Okay, so from self-love, everyone makes it their principle to shorten their life when it's longer duration threatens more troubles than it promises agreeableness then we need to transform this generalized maxim into a law of nature. So we get, it's a law of nature that from self-love, everyone makes it their principle to shorten uh, their life when it's longer duration threatens more troubles than it promises agreeableness. And then finally, we, uh, we need to determine whether we can, without self-contradiction, conjoin this hypothetical law of nature to the existing laws of nature as we understand them to be. And Kant argues that we can't. And hence, uh, the maxim fails the contradiction and conception test. And so it is impermissible to act upon. Okay. Uh, now, here's what Kant writes. Uh, we'll have to try to figure out what he means exactly. He says, a nature whose law it would be to destroy life itself by means of the same feeling whose destination is to impel towards the furtherance of life would contradict itself and would therefore not subsist as nature. Thus the maxim uh, could not uh, possibly be a law of nature and accordingly altogether oppose the supreme uh, principle of all duty. Okay, so Kant's idea is that we can't, without self-contradiction, conjoin the hypothetical law of nature to the existing laws of nature as we understand them, uh, given our teleological understanding of nature. Specifically, right, uh, the following principle, according to Kant, is part of our understanding of nature. So on the slide here, we have the principle of natural teleology. If F is a feeling whose natural function is to produce effect E, then it would be self-contradictory to suppose that there could be a system of nature that includes a law that under circumstances C, F produces the contrary of E. That seems to be the general principle that he's appealing to. Well, since self-love has the natural function of furthering life, it follows from the principle of natural te teleology that it's self-contradictory to suppose that there could be a system of nature that includes uh, a, a law that under circumstances of more troubles than agreeableness, self-love endeavors to shorten life. And since we can't coherently suppose that there could be such a system of nature, we can't coherently will that there should be such a system of nature and hence the maxim of shortening life from self-love when it's longer duration threatens more troubles than agreeableness is impermissible. Now, interestingly, Kant's argument here is controversial less for deploying the formula of law of nature than in the contradiction and conception test than for its application of this principle of natural teleology, specifically uh, 
uh, at least ever since uh, Darwin, it's controversial whether nature is in fact teleological in the way that Kant understands it to be. And even if it were, it would still be controversial whether self-love has the specific natural function that Kant uh, <clears throat> assigns to it. So um, uh, uh, it's important to note any potential shortcomings of these arguments, uh, because as we'll see when we <clears throat> uh, get to the second formula, uh, we'll get new versions of these arguments, and very often they're more compelling, right? So uh, we should make note of uh, any limitations of the arguments there are at this stage and compare them when we get to the second stage. Okay, so notice suicide, that was a duty, uh, prohibition on suicide, that's a duty owed to oneself. Uh, and uh, it's what uh, um, he's going to later call a perfect duty. And we'll explain what those are later. The second example argues that the following uh, maxims uh, impermissible. When I believe myself to be in need of money, I shall borrow money and promise to repay it, even though I know that this will never happen. Okay, so let's begin the procedure. First, we generalize the maxim. Uh, uh, when everyone believes themselves to be in need of money, they will borrow money and promise to repay it, even though they know this will never happen. You take that generalized maxim, convert it into a law of nature. It's a law of nature that uh, everyone uh, believes that when everyone believes themselves to be in need of money, they will borrow money and promise to repay it, even though they know that this will never happen. Now, uh, the next step is to determine whether we can, without self-contradiction, conjoin this hypothetical law of nature to the existing laws of nature as we understand them to be, Kant argues that we cannot, and hence the maxim is impermissible. So here's the argument for the universality of a law that everyone, when, he, uh, when they believe themselves to be in need, could promise whatever they please with the intention of not keeping it would make the promise and the end might, might have in it impossible since no one would believe what was promised, but would laugh at all such uh, expressions as vain uh, pretenses. Okay, so Kant's idea is that we can't, without self-contradiction, conjoin the hypothetical law of nature to the existing laws of nature as we understand them, given the nature of promising. Specifically, uh, the following principle seems to govern our practice of promising. There seems to be a necessary condition on promising. Kant seems to presuppose that promises are only possible if the promiser is justified in thinking that the promise will be believed, okay? Uh, after all, if the promise isn't believed, then uh, uh, the promise won't, won't have uh, taken effect. Um, now, the, the issue here is that conjoining this hypothetical law of nature with the existing laws of nature would bring it about that no promises uh, would be believed. Uh, under such circumstances, no promises would be possible. And so since we can't coherently suppose that we could, that there could be such a system of nature, we can't coherently will that there should be such a system of nature and hence the maxima borrowing money when in need of it and promising to repay it with no intention of doing so is uh, uh, impermissible, okay? Okay, so this test and this example like the previous one uh, use the contradiction and conception test. Uh, this duty, unlike the previous duty, was a duty owed to another person, right? And like the previous duty was also a, uh, a, a perfect duty. Um, let's look at the uh, 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 third example. Um, now, again, while these previous two examples deployed the contradiction in, in conception tests. 
Kant's third and fourth example is going to deploy the contradiction and volition test. Uh, <clears throat> so in the third example, Kant argues the following is going to be, uh, following maxims going to be impermissible. I will neglect the development of my natural talents, instead devote myself to idleness and pleasure. Uh, generalizing this uh, uh, so that it applies to everyone, he says, everyone will neglect the development of their natural talents, instead devote themselves to idleness and pleasure. Uh, transforming this generalized maxim into a hypothetical law of nature, we get it's a law of nature that everyone will neglect the development of their natural talents, instead devote themselves to idleness and pleasure. Um, now, uh, Kant, however, now we should at this point conjoin this hypothetical law of nature to the existing laws of nature and see if we, res if we get a coherent uh, system of nature as a result. Um, but notice Kant doesn't deny that we can, without self-contradiction, conjoin the hypothetical laws of nature to the existing laws of nature. Uh, uh, he says, nature could indeed always subsist with such a universal law, although the human beings would let uh, their talent rust and be concerned with do devoting themselves merely to idleness, amusement, procreation, in a word, to enjoyment, okay? So we can coherently conceive of the resulting system of nature. The problem is, according to Kant, we can't coherently will that such a system of nature obtain. And why? Well, he says, for as a rational being, he necessarily wills that all the capacities in him be developed since they serve him and are given to him for all sorts of possible purposes. Now, this is uh, an, importantly, uh, uh, an important and distinctively Kantian idea uh, that there are ends that every rational being must will, okay? Uh, among them uh, is the end of putting, uh, giving yourself all the capacities uh, that you possibly can for a wide variety of different purposes. Um, Kant is less explicit, however, about the specific rational principle from which he drives this result. I mean, there are candidates available. Uh, rusting talents might be inconsistent with the counsels of prudence, for example, but he just doesn't say in this specific uh, 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 passage. Um, okay, let's, and notice rusting talents, uh, the prohibition on rusting talents, that's a duty owed to oneself, and it's going to be an imperfect duty, whatever that means. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but first, let's go over the fourth example. Um, and, the, and here, Kant's going to argue the following maxim is going to be impermissible. Let each be as happy as heaven wills, or as he can make himself. I shall take nothing from him, nor even envy him. Only I do not care to contribute to his welfare or to his assistance in need. Okay. So by now you should know the routine. First, we generalize the maxim. No one will harm anyone, but everyone will refuse to contribute to another's welfare or to provide assistance in need. And we tr next is to transform this generalized maxim into a hypothetical law of nature. So it's a law of nature that no one harms anyone, but everyone refuses to contribute to another's welfare or to provide assistance when in need. Now. Kant does not deny that we can conceive without self-contradiction the resulting system of nature. Uh, 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 so he says, uh, now if such a way of thinking were to become a universal law, the human race could admittedly very well subsist, no doubt even better than when, one, when everyone prates about sympathy and benevolence and even exerts themselves to practice them occasionally 
but on the other hand, also cheats where they can and sells the rights of human beings or otherwise is, infringes upon them. So uh, he thinks the resulting system of nature is possible, and he also thinks it might actually be better than the existing law of nature. Um, so while we can coherently conceive the resulting system of nature, we can't coherently will that such a system of nature obtains. And here's why the quotes on the slide, for a will that decided this would conflict with itself, since many cases could occur in which one would need the love and sympathy of others in which by such a law of nature, arisen from his own will, he would rob himself of all hopes of the assistance he wishes for himself. Okay, so look, how are we to understand the contradiction in volition? Uh, in utilitarianism, uh, Mill suggests uh, the contradiction in volition test should be understood as follows. He writes, to give any meaning to Kant's principle, the sense put upon it must be that we ought to shape our conduct by a rule which all rational beings might adopt adopt which benefit to their collective interest. Okay, unfortunately, the sense Mill puts upon Kant's principle could not be the sense that Kant intends. Remember, Kant thinks that the system of nature in which no one harms anyone, but everyone refuses aid is better than the existing system of nature but the corresponding maxim is impermissible nonetheless. So the contradiction and volition test could not be grounded in an appeal to utility as Mill evidently believed. Now, Mill didn't intend his interpretation of the contradiction and volition test as a criticism of Kant. Schopenhauer's uh, interpretation of the test is so intended. According to Schopenhauer, Kant's application of the contradiction and volition test in the fourth example makes what would be, by Kant's lights, an illicit appeal to self-interest. After all, Kant does make a claim about what a person must will on the grounds of self-interest, that a person might require the aid of others, and hence cannot rationally will that a system of nature obtain in which they're deprived of that aid. And whilst Kant argument does employ a premise about rational self-interest, Kant's conclusion's not grounded in an illicit appeal to self-interest. Notice that Kant's making a hypothetical claim. They're not, he's not claiming what is in fact in a person's self-interest. Uh, but he's making a claim about uh, what would be in a person's self-interest if the maxim were a law of nature. So no claim is being made about what is in fact in their interest, giving the existence laws of nature. So the duty to give aid is not grounded in what is in fact uh, uh, in a person's self-interest in the way that Schopenhauer seems to be uh, suggesting. Okay, so now the four examples are meant to be uh, exemplars of a fourfold division of duties. Okay, so duties are distinguished with respect to their objects. As I've emphasized, there are duties to oneself, such as the prohibition on suicide or the prohibition on rusting talents, and there are duties owed to other uh, uh, human beings, such as the prohibition on making false promises and the prohibition on refusing aid. Um, and uh, the duties are also uh, distinguished with whether uh, between whether they're perfect or imperfect. Uh, and we'll have to say just a little bit about that. Um, Perfect duties, uh, he, he says, uh, do not admit of exception in favor of inclination, whereas imperfect duties do. What does that mean? What could that possibly mean? We'll see in a moment, okay? Uh, notice that 
the division into perfect and imperfect duties corresponds with the application of the two universalizability tests, right? So if a maxim violated uh, uh, a perfect duty, then uh, that maxim is going to violate the contradiction and conception test. Whereas if a maxim violates an imperfect duty, that maxim is going to violate the contradiction in volition test. So we get a correspondence between the kind of duty uh, 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 that it is and which of these two tests uh, are get uh, <clears throat> violated, okay? Um, so what is this distinction between perfect and imperfect duties, okay? Well, a perfect duty is a duty to adopt, uh, to perform a certain action right, or <clears throat> not to perform a certain action in the case of prohibitions. But the object of the duty is an action, right? Imperfect duties aren't requirements to perform a certain action or to refrain from a certain action. Rather, imperfect duties are requirements on the adoption of an end or to refrain from adopting a, a certain end. And this makes a difference, okay? Why? Well, I could adopt a certain end, right? Perhaps I've adopted the end of learning Latin, right? Well, I've got lots of ends, right? Uh, you know, I need to do the grocery shopping later. I uh, need to teach this course, right? All these ends have to somehow cohere, right? So we prioritize among our ends and we schedule uh, means to their fulfillment. And whatever means to their fulfillment uh, we uh, adopt, uh, we make sure aren't inconsistent with these other ends, right? So our ends have to practically cohere, okay? So consider my adopting the end of learning Latin, right? Uh, this might be my way of uh, 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 um, developing my talents within me and thus not allowing my talents to rust, as it were. Um, so um, uh, does this mean I should drop tools and immediately start learning Latin? No, I'm obliged to give this lecture after all, okay? Uh, so uh, it's because I've got other ends right, uh, that I'm not required to act on the adoption of the end in question, okay? So since imperfect duties are requirements on ends, and then there, and there's this requirement of rationality that your ends sort of cohere with one another, right? That means you, in a case of an imperfect duty, you don't have to be acting on the relevant end at any given time, okay? Uh, so on the prohibition of rusting talents, right, you don't have to drop tools and develop your capacities right this instance, right, uh, at least if that conflicts with some other uh, requirement on, on your duty. So that's the way it admits of exceptions due to inclination, right? It really comes down to what are the objects of these duties. The objects of perfect duties are actions, they're requirements that you either perform or don't perform a certain action. The requirements of imperfect duties are that you adopt certain ends uh, and uh, whether you act specifically towards that end, well, that depends on what other ends you may have adopted, okay? Um, now, um, um, now, there's a, let's look at the correspondence thesis. How plausible is it? You know, it's telling that this simple categorization of duties uh, gets abandoned for a much more complicated scheme uh, uh, later uh, in the metaphysics of morals. And in part, I think, because Kant recognizes uh, that the correspondence thesis uh, can't work. I mean, one difficulty is going to be the existence of maxims that can be conceived without contradiction, uh, uh, but where acting on that maxim violates a perfect duty, right? Uh, so 
consider the maxim, <clears throat> I will kill another human being when it's a safe and effective way of furthering my interest. Generalizing, everyone shall kill another uh, human being when it's a safe and effective way of furthering their self-interest. Transforming this into a generalized uh, maxim into the, a law of nature we get. It's a law of nature that everyone shall kill another human being when it's a safe an effective way of furthering their self-interest. And while we may be unable to will right, the resulting system of nature, it's at least arguable that we can conceive of it without, without contradiction, right? The circumst specified circumstances, when it's a safe and effective way of furthering our self-interest, more or less guarantees that, right? But this max, to act on this maxim, right, would obviously violate a perfect duty of justice. Uh, and duties of justice are, are perfect duties, if any are, right? Uh, so <clears throat> uh, it's difficult, I think, in the end, to maintain the correspondence thesis that perfect duties go along uh, with uh, duties that violate the contradiction in conception test. Um, okay, that's what I've got uh, for uh, uh, about the first formula in the uh, 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 second section. Next time, we're going to continue on with the second section, and we'll look at the second formula. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and the second formula is going to consider, sir, not the form of the law, but the matter. What does he mean here? Well, the form of the law was, uh, it's this formal feature that it was valid for all rational beings. The matter of the law is going to be the substantive value that grounds this formal feature. Uh, and uh, uh, so, <clears throat> and we're going to, again, look at the derivation and then look at the applications of the formula. Uh, this is going to be important for two reasons. First, the second formula, the formula of humanity, many regard as emotionally resonant, but claim it's difficult to apply, unlike the first formula. That's why people tend to only teach the first formula. But if you look at Kant's own ethical theorizing, he mostly uses the second formula to derive his, uh, his moral claims. So we're going to have to try to understand how to apply the, the, the second formula. The other reason it's important is we will reconsider these uh, four examples of duties again, and we'll discover something important. Once we get clear about the val substantive value that grounds uh, uh, the form of the law, right? Uh, we get much more compelling arguments for our conclusions, okay? Uh, so um, uh, pay close attention to the discussion of these four examples. We'll be discussing them again next week uh, with respect to uh, uh, the, the, the second uh, formula. Um, okay, uh, that's all I have for you today. Thanks very much and We'll talk to you next week.